Hello people, Feet here. Today I want to show you the builds that I'm using for the Flesh and Faith DLC. I did a similar video for the Blazing Desert, and in that one, I said that there were only two builds, Butterforge and Nimble, and I don't ever use hybrids. Well, I was wrong. Since then, I have been enlightened by the diversity of Battle Brothers genders, I mean builds. Allow me to present you my MS Paint prowess. There we go. It might look intimidating at first, but it's just three overlapping circles. Now, I used to think that there were only two circles, Butterforge and Nimble, and they don't ever touch each other. But now, not only they are touching, and there's something beautiful happening between them, but there's also a third circle that touches the other two circles. And there's something going on between all of them. And where everything intersects resides something unfathomable that we will go into soon. Okay, so over here we have Butterforge and Nimble, the two infamous perks, right? But now, Dodge has also joined the server. And in fact, Dodge has been in the server since Blazing Desert, when they added the Hyena Clock, um, the rework card potions, and rework Re Relentless. So now we can mix them together, like Bob Ross mixing paint on his palette. Okay, so all the bills over here, they all have up and down sides. In order to decide which way to make a brother, you must first understand the pros and cons of each. First is Battleforge. Battleforge means you wear the heaviest armor. The more armor you have in total, the more armor damage you reduce. Note that it's not damage you reduce, but armor damage. All right, I will now attempt with my best effort to explain the damage system in Battle Brothers. Let's say you weigh 300 armor, both head and body. Um, that is 600 armor in total, right? Battle Force will give you 5% of that as armor damage redu reduction, which means you get 30% armor damage reduction. Now, if an enemy hits you in the body for 100 armor damage, you would only take 70 because Battleforge had reduced that 100 damage by 30%, which is 30. So your armor would only lose 70 durability. Battleforge saved your armor durability so it lasts longer in fight. And it also saved you the tools from repairing. Alright, now let's say. That 100 armor damage right there comes from a hit from a great sword that has 100 base damage, 25% armor pain, and 100% armor damage. Uh, all right. And base damage, all right. That's a great sword right there, okay? It's a great sword, right? That's, that's a great sword stat. Uh, that's max damage. Um, so 100 damage and 100% armor damage would do 100 damage. and Would do 100 armor damage, right? But it also will do 25% armor pain. Which means 25% damage can go straight to your HP. But that 25 damage will be blocked by 10% of the current durability of the armor piece that got hit. In this case, it got hit in the body for 70, which means we will have uh, 230 left. And 10% of that is going to block the 25, which is 23, right? So, the, uh, the, uh, the HP damage we take at the end will only be 2. So 2 damage is not much at all from a Great Sword hit. Uh, when it hits a 300 armor in the body. But it is already enough to trigger Fearsome. So, and if you get hit by a bigger weapon with more armor pain, like a big hammer or a big mace or big axe, you will take more HP damage. Some of those have 50% um, armor pain. So instead of taking 25, I'm going to take 30, 50, let's say. 
And then I'm gonna take 20, like 20, I don't know, uh, 7. Yeah, I'm gonna take 27 damage instead if it were a bigger weapon. Right. Not to mention, those weapons might destroy more armor too. So we'll have less armor to block, so that damage might be even higher. And if it get, gets high enough, in like if you take like 30 damage and your total HP is like 80, you might take an injury. So injury is very scary because some injury just straight up affect your combat potential, make you have less defense so you can't protect yourself, make you have less hit chance so you can't hit them back, or just, yeah, things like that. So injury is the thing that we want to prevent the most here. Note that the Battleforge armor reduction, the 30% over here, comes from the current total armor you have. So as the fight goes on, as you take more hits, your armor will go down, and so does the armor damage reduction. Which means the more armor you lose, the faster you lose it. And the less armor you have currently, if it goes down, the less you can block, and the more damage, the more HP damage you take. So Battle Forge is very strong at the beginning, but as the fight goes on, Battle Forge will get worse. And if your armor gets low enough, you'll be very vulnerable to injury. Um, but potentially, Battle Forge with full fame armor can be strong. A lot of fame armor have about 350, so uh, 350 each. So you might have about 700 in total instead of 600. And this number might jump up to 35%. And the more you have, right, the slower the, your, you lose armor. So the difference between 700 total armor and 600 total armor is quite huge because you have an extra 100 armor. And that extra 100 armor takes slower to go down. So yeah, with full fame armor setup, only the biggest weapon can hurt you. And even then, um, you can probably just shrug off the first big hit. But the second big hit will hurt you for sure. And also be careful of champions with fame weapons, because champions have 15% damage. Like It's just like they have a, a, an extra huge threat, but they have 15% extra, and amongst a lot of other stat boosts. And also, on top of that, they have the fame weapons, which might have increased damage and armor pain too, so if they get like those things lined up right, they can cut through butter force like butter. Anything with low damage though, like arrows and spears, say one hand flail, you will just dust them off like it's nothing. Even crossbow with the high armor pain, but if they have low base damage, right? If the armor pain is high, but if that base damage is like 50, then they can only get 25 damage through, right? And 25 damage can be blocked by 23 just easily. So you need to get hit by the big hits to feel the hurt. Uh, yeah, so Battleforge overall can tank small to medium hits, a lot of them. They can tank a lot of hits, but they need to be small hits. It's quick against big weapons, because um, they can just go through the armor and injure you right away. But there are ways to help you deal with that. So first of all, most pure Battleforge build over here, you will have Steel Brows to protect your head. Headshots are extra nasty. They deals, I think, 25% more damage to HP, not to your armor, but to your HP. So whatever damage that go through your armor is 25% more. So you can't block them as easily, which means they can injure you that much easier. And blunt head injuries are like the worst. Um, there are two of them, which are um, fractured skull and severe concussion. They both just take 50% of your stat away everywhere. So if you get hit by a big mice or a big ham in the head, and you get one of those fracture skull and stuff, you are as good as that, right? Other people will have to come and save you. You can't defend yourself anymore. So that's why you take steel brow on this battle force build, even with fame helmet. Those things can still, you know, injure you. So with with steel brow and good enough HP total, about ninety plus, you might still get injured sometimes. But at least it won't be those severe injuries that just make you as good as that. Uh, second, to protect your body, you can have fur padding, which reduce the uh, the HP damage you take by 34%, which means you only take 66%. Um, yeah. 
whatever damage over there, right? You will take only 66% of that. So you can block them easier. In the Great Sword case, right? If you only take 66% of the 25 they do, 23 can block it fully. So, for fighting is pretty strong. It will prolong the safety of Battle Force by quite a bit too. So for normal Battle Force, right, without fur padding, if you lose like maybe half your armor, you have to be really careful now. But for with fur padding, you might need to lose maybe two thirds of your armor before you need to really worry. So fur padding is very strong against big hits. Against small hits that don't go through armor, it does nothing though. And then, um, and then you can have bone plating. Bone plating can block an entire hit every fight. It can be a big hit. It can block an entire giant hammer hit from a champion, which is amazing, which is insane value. But it can also block one tiny arrow from a goblin. But hey, even then, it still saves you tools, right? So bone plating saves you tools every fight. Fur padding saves you from the biggest hit, but the small hit doesn't matter at all. It doesn't do anything against them. And otherwise, right? So you can protect your head by steel brow and you protect your body with attachment. Aside from fur padding and bone plating, which are the most common ones that I use, you can also use Kraken that reduce uh, incoming damage by 10%. So the base damage get reduced by 10% to begin with. So everything else is lower. The armor damage will be less, armor pain will be less too. So yeah, Kraken plate is also decent. I'm not sure if it's better than the other two. Right, I think right. So, um, Kraken is good in really long fights where your armor go down to like very low, but there's no big hits in there. Basically, it's like um, uh, monolith, right? For monolith, you take so many hits, it should be reduced by ten percent. It's pretty decent. It also gives you a sub extra durability. By the way, I think they buff that. Uh, the plummeting is terrible in those long fights that you take. A lot of damage. It only blocks one hit out of maybe 10, so it's not that great. But in short fights, in, in everyday common fight, in short fights, in fight against a lot of big enemies, say, uh, I mean, in maybe short arena fights, you know, it, it saves you to every fight. Short fights, uh, common fights, save you to every time. Sometimes it will save you from a big hit. It's insane value, otherwise, it just saves you tools. Fur padding protects you from the biggest hit that might kill you. There's also a fifth one, which is the Lingworm Clock. Lingworm Clock gives you the most durability, 60, which is quite significant. And because it increases your durability that much, right, it also affects your total uh, armor. Let's say, yeah, let's say that's 760 now. Because your total armor is increased, it also blocks more damage, right? It block more damage with a 10%. And it's the only attachment that can kind of do something about your head helmet. It, it block a little bit more damage when you get headshot, right? So yeah, it's the only thing that does a tiny little bit for headshots. So if headshots your problem, maybe you want to try that out. But overall, you know, uh, bone plating for padding is your everyday yeah, attachment. So head, Steel brow, body, attachment. Wear big armor. That's what Battle Forge is all about. So in general, Battle Forge is for the frontliners. It allows them to shock off arrows that will come their way. And shock off small hits. They need to be careful about big hits though. And you still need a lot of defense. Because if you have low defense, basically you want to lose in your entire Battle Forge armor AP5. And you can't repair but the Forge armor very fast because it takes a long time. Every fight, if you lose like 20% with your Battle Forge armor, it's okay. You can repair them before the next fight. But if you lose like 40%, 50%, or maybe all of your armor every fight, the next fight comes, you want to start your fight with, you know, like 200 durability. Then, yeah, you're going to die. So they need enough defense, they need enough attack. Uh, max those out, by the way. They need enough, like, they need both of them maxed out, right? Um, so, 
the rest of the points will go into HP. You need enough HP about 80 to 90 at yeah at least. Like the minimum I go is 80. More is nice, but don't neglect um, resolve. You need at least 50 resolve. Maybe maybe 45 is acceptable because you have you know you have arena buff which is plus 10 right. From arena you get maybe plus five from a necklace, and sometimes you can drink the resolve potion which gives you twenty, and your banner also gives you resolve about fifteen. So your resolve, you know, like forty five plus all that, you're gonna be pretty healthy. Like like when the time comes and you need it really badly, you can drink that resolve potion for twenty more. So normally you can get about uh, seventy, right? All that about seventy. Seventy resolve. So yeah, 80, 90 HP, 45, 50 resolve. The rest you're gonna go into fatigue. And that is so that you can wear heavy armor and still have a decent amount of fatigue left to hit things. So you need after all that armor, you probably want about 50 to 60 fatigue. Right? Depends if you take brawny or not. I don't take brawny. So sometimes I might have to work with about 45. 50 instead of 50, 60. So, yeah. You need fatigue to hit things. You need attack to hit things. You need defense to not get hit. You're not, you need enough HP to not get one shot or take too many injuries. And you need the resolve to, you know, not break. Well, you only need that much fatigue, though. Right? That is after armor, by the way. That, that is usable fatigue. How much you can use. You don't need that much, though, if you use the fatigue neutral build. The Tick Neutral build is basically, well, you pump up max attack and defense like normal, but you don't put point into fatigue at all. So that all that point here, you can pump into more HP and even more resolve to just feel really, really, well, reliable. So you don't get one shot, you don't get injured that easily, and nothing can break you, really. The downside is that you can only hit once per turn. Just one hit per turn, no secondary fancy attack. Just hit casually once per turn. Ideally with a weapon that hit really hard once per turn. Okay, Great Axe. Maybe Big Hammer. Maybe Big Maze too. But Great Axe is uh, the best. The Great, Axe, the Great Axe is so good that just simply hitting once per turn is sufficient damage to contribute to the fight that you can pump up even more HP and resolve so you can be more stronger right just walk up to enemy and slap them without worry the other battle force when they see a a scary enemy like a big orc warlord they might be a bit scared right to get in there and hit them this guy well he has that little bit of extra to get in there and smash so this is a maze tool list. He's going to have Berserk uh, recover because the maze is a 4 AP weapon. The Great Axe is a 6 AP weapon, the maze is 4 AP, so he's going to have Berserk recover. Just like the Dagger, I mean, just like the Cleaver, both of those builds, they can be Battle Forge, pure Battle Forge, or they can be Nimble Forge. We're going to talk about Nimble Forge a bit later, but uh, the Battle Forge is for the 4 AP attacker, right, with Berserk recover. It's for the Fatigue neutral, two-hander, and there's also the two-hander with Berserk. Well, they can't Berserk recover, but simply being able to Berserk every once in a while, maybe just once or twice per fight, is good enough. So I still go two-hand hammer with high fatigue, so I can maybe AoE once or twice, maybe Berserk one or once or twice, right? He won't have as high... HP and resolve at this guy because he has to pump point into, you know, fatigue right here. But the trade off is that, well, he can smash, he can use secondary attack like AoE, and he can hit Berserk once or twice to fight. Well, um, before he has to recover, or maybe he won't have recovered at all. Maybe he just Berserk once or twice and then just go hit once per turn, just like this guy. Or he might have to recover for a turn and then, you know, he can go in AoE more. Alright, so that's for the Battle Forge build, okay? Let's move on to Nimble, shall we? Nimble, 
reduce HP damage you take up to 60% depending on how light you wear, right? So minus 60% damage. That means you won't get injured as easily. In fact, you are quite resistant to it. Even if you take a big hit from a big weapon, you won't get injured. Though your armor will be gone pretty quick. And you can take you can take way fewer hits than Battleforge, right? Battleforge can take more, but they get injured more easily. Generally, nimble builds aren't there for tanking. It is there to just not die, right? So you don't want to get hit. You can shock off a few hits, but you don't want to tank that much at all. You won't die instantly when you actually get hit. So if something goes wrong, you know you won't die instantly. You will have time to react with Nimble. So the, for the Nimble builds, right, you either want to stay in the back line where there are not a lot of fighting. You have the Archer over here and you have the Banner and maybe other kind of pikemen in the back line. If you want to stay in the front line though, right, you need a shield or else arrow will just shred your armor before you even get to the enemies. And you either need shield or you need dodge. Dodge will give you the range defense you need to stay in the front. Um, there is also this thrower frontline build that I like to use, who, who is basically a thrower duelist with a sword in a backpack or maybe a spear in the backpack so that they can defend themselves when enemy go near them and they stay in the front line so they can throw javelins. Um, they're only used in the very early game uh, where you fight mostly brigands and nomad. The javelin is very effective against them so that's where this guy come into play. As the game go on, right, as you run into more archers as you know, like the brigand group spawn with four plus archers, the goblin spawn with six plus archers. This guy, if he stay in the front line on turn one, his armor is completely gone, right? Instantly. So he doesn't, yeah, he's an early game build. If you keep him mid late game, you ne might need to put him in the back line along with those, those two over here, all right? So yeah, with Nimble, you know you won't die instantly. Um, but just make sure they don't get hit that much, or else they will die. Quick. Just not right away, but quick enough. Okay, so what do we get when we combine Nimble and Battleforge? We get the Nimbleforge. Now, the Nimbleforge for me is quite interchangeable with pure Battleforge. I, I only built them for the 4 AP Berserk Recover guy. Right, basically Mace Duelist and Two Hand Cleaver. Those two can both be pure Battleforge or Nimbleforge. So what's the up and downside of each, right? So Nimbleforge is basically this build. But instead of taking Steel Brow to protect your head, you just take Nimble instead. You just swap on perk placement and you got this build. If you wear lighter armor, you have Nimble instead of Steel Brow. That's it. It's quite simple to transition. The upside for Nimble Force is that you have more fatigue, right? And those two weapons are quite fatigue intensive. You need to hit multiple times per turn and you need to sometimes stun or maybe sometimes decapitate. That's quite fatigue intensive. So having a higher fatigue pool allows you to, you know, like do all that, chop things up faster. These guys are the giga damage dealer in your team right there. And whenever they hit that Berserk Recover turn, because of the higher fatigue pool, they will recover more fatigue too. So that's the upside of Nimble Forge. So what about tankiness, right? What do I get for going Nimble Forge instead of Battle Forge? Well, you are less tanky, first of all. In some way, not in all ways, in some way. You gain more injury resistance um, compared to, say, a Bone Plating. Overall, the fur padding is still better, with seal brow is still better. Both head and body. Fur padding doesn't protect you against puncture. If a goblin shank you, it's still gonna hurt like hell. Nimble Forge kind of resists a little bit of that. Alright, so pure nimble can reduce about 60% damage to the body. Nimble Forge, you can expect about half of that maybe. 30 to 20% reduction. 
uh yeah 30 20 to 30 percent and that is enough to shock off a lot of injuries and they can still shock off a lot of hits because they still have battle force right but just less and the upside is that you get more stamina to smash people right i like that trade off quite a bit that's how i like to build my two-hand cleaver in my steel list okay next up let's talk about the uh, nimble dodge real quick um the fencer and the uh decker duelist they have been here for quite a while they are really strong um with fame armor right the armor can get to 200 plus body armor can get to 200 plus helmet can get to maybe 170 so quite a lot of armor too with fame items but what they got is a lot of dodge right they pump all they pump all their points into attack uh yeah they pump all their points to attack and quite a bit into defense right you can you can you can kind of not go all out on defense because dodge can help you you have to spread point between hp and resolve of course just like the others for nimble i also go about eight 80 maybe 70 if you are really tight on points right for the nimble dodge build if you're really tight on point you might want 70 you might go 70 hp that is 70 with colossus by the way so hp about 70 to 80 maybe more is great resolve you might want to scheme up on some resolve too because yeah you need a lot of points right uh 45 maybe maybe even 40 45 all right and the rest you go into initiative. Initiative. The rest you go to it. So for the dagger, you have you need less initiative. For the dagger, you need maybe uh, one thirty after everything. The fencer though, you really need a lot. You need like one fifty plus for the fencer. So the fencer, he need a lot of initiative. He needs enough resolve, enough HP. He need max out attack, and he needs as much defense as he can get. So he's so point starved that we might need to, you know, cut on a little bit of HP and resolve and sometimes a bit of defense. But, well, the trade-off is that, well, we get a super fast guy, basically he has permanent adrenaline, always move first. And moving first comes with a few benefits. Like, immune to stun. With turn order manipul manipulation, you can be immune to stun and sand and some other effect. A lot of effects will last less on them will last shorter on them too if you move first so they that is one of the upside the fence also get giga damage out of all that in initiative like like so much damage so much mobility too and the dagger i also go overwhelm on the fencer but the dagger really shine with overwhelm overwhelm allows you to yeah like debuff enemy by three times ten percent right that's that's like 30 30 plus 30 hit chance just gone from them so yeah those are the benefits and also not to mention dodge give them extra defense so they already got quite but like a lot of defense to begin with but they also have initiative from dodge defense so they have way higher defense than anyone else okay about seven initiative is one dodge all right seven initiative is one dodge so the hyena clock 15 initiative which means it's 2 dodge whenever you need to you can drink that cat potion which is 20 initiative which translates into about 3 dodge so uh yeah they can get 3 more defense every time they want if they drink the potion so that's cool yeah and just simply from moving first right having someone who can move first all the time you know overwhelm enemies kill them before they move i i love these guys they are so useful Overwhelm is good against everything. There is nothing in this game that doesn't get affected by Overwhelm, right? Some enemies can resist Fearsome, and some enemies can resist Stun. Nothing resists. Some enemies resist Net. Nothing will resist Overwhelm though, except for maybe uh, like Kraken and some, some enemies that don't attack like a Net Priest, right? So you can Overwhelm Ifrit, you can Overwhelm Lini Worms, I suppose, but you probably don't want to go in there and melee linear worm you can overwhelm the champions right so nice all right the last one i want to talk about are the dodge battle force build okay 
the dash battle fudge build is they are basically the fatigue neutral build right and fatigue neutral means that you don't pump any point into into fatigue at all you just you just you know like your normal bro may start out with about 95 fatigue let's say and i think your armor let's say you wear oh god let's say you wear you know like 15 helmets and maybe 25 armor i mean that's if i bit light i say let's say you wear 30 armor right maybe even fame armor with attachment something like that you're gonna lose about 45 right with all those weights you're gonna have 40 left with that 40 you don't have to carry an item a weapon that might cost about maybe 10 i don't know maybe 12 and then you might have a backpack weapon too that might cost half of that maybe six so 40 minus 18 is what 22 all right you have 22 fatigue left what can you do with 22 fatigue quite a lot you can hit once per turn with most weapons so they are here for that just hit once per turn with the great axe or maybe big hammer or big mace or big flare whatever you want just hit it once per turn so what's the trade-off of hitting once per turn is that uh, all that fatigue that uh, you know you don't need to put point in you can put into other stuff right so they of course go max attack and defense as for any any other front line attack defense max this guy this guy right is the fatigue neutral build he put point into hp and resolve to be more tanky sturdy right this guy though he only go normal hp and resolve just like those two uh, but all that extra point from fatigue right they can pump into initiative and translate all that into dodge so they pump initiative and translate it into dodge so that means his defense is like like extra defense they won't be they won't have as much as defensor because they have to wear heavy armor and it take away from the dodge but they will still have quite a bit to spare in my experience they can have about 70 initiative and that translates into about 10 extra defense and they can always drink the potion for three more if you need to okay so yeah so they have more more defense than others and they have the highest armor, right? They can get Battle Force armor and have higher defense than Battle Force people. That's the upside. The trade-off is that they can reach once per turn though. So their damage output might be lower. Okay, so that is for like the 200 guy, right? The damage is low, but with a great egg, it's still gonna be good enough. And they have extra defense to be, you know, like extra defense is always nice, right? And they're also fast, which is kind of an upside too, especially for the big weapons, because like some weapons, they they don't do well against big armor, right? Some weapons do though, like big armor, big axe do well against armor. So you kind of want those guys that do well against armor to move first, to smash that armor first, right? So that people who are slower with weapons that don't like armor that much can follow up and capitalize on that armor damage. That's those guys did already, like the maze duelist. Maybe the cleaver, a uh, two-hand cleaver who are slow like with heavy armor, let's say. The Butterforce version, not the Butterforce George. The Butterforce George might be fast, but you can always just wait turn with those guys. If, and wait for those that to attack first before they hit with the cleaver. But if you don't have to wait, then your battle flow will be a lot more natural. Um, it just goes smoother. Sometimes you can't wait, you know. It's just more convenient. So fast, big hitter. That's, yeah with high defense that's what they are well um the downside though is that they they also stick steel route to protect their helmet to protect the headshot but their body they don't have the the bone plating they don't have the fur padding so they are quite vulnerable to the big hits they have the high enough clock that gives them two defense uh, when they you translate initiative to dodge so they have more defense so they get hit less but if they get unlucky can get hit by a big hit then they might be in trouble so yeah okay what about the tank though this is the only tank that i put into this three circles 
but there exists a tank version for any of the thing here. They all have different upside downside. I will go into them later. But for this guy, right, he's a Butterforce Dodge tank. That means he has extra, extra defense, right? Not only from the shield and the shield mastery, they also get defense from their own de natural defense, right? That they pump all their point in. They also get the defense from dodge, right? So that three time defense. But you might ask, oh, but they don't have the stamina. How do they, you know, keep their shield wall up? Well, shield wall costs 20 stamina per turn. 20 stamina per turn. Um, you recover 15 per turn, right? How do you get five more to, you know, recover 20 per turn so that you can shield wall every turn? That's what we are after. Well, you get, you get that from three sources. One is Iron Lungs, which is plus three fatigue recovery every turn. Second is Fatigue Potion. That is plus four every turn. But every time you want to do that, you need to bring a potion though. So that might not be ideal. And the third is a Fame Shield that might have from minus one to minus three fatigue per shield wall. Right. If you find the minus one, Per shield wall, you can combine that with a fatigue potion to shield wall every turn. You find the minus three or minus two per turn, you can combine those with the iron lungs to shield wall every turn. So ideally, we find a guy with iron lungs and high defense and some initiative. And we make them into a Battleforge dodge tank who has defense from their high defense, from their dodge, from their shield, and from their permanent shield wall. They shield wall every single turn, all right, without fail. So that is so much defense. Like you never, you just don't see this much defense. Um, the only guy that can tough the defense is like the dodge tank, but with nimble version because lighter armor gives more defense from dodge, right? But this guy can weigh the heaviest of armor. So yeah, hey, super heavy armor, crazy high defense. Basically, anything is going to have 5% hit chance against them. It's just, well, again, right? They don't get hit that often, but if they get hit by a big one, they don't have fur fighting, they don't have bone plating. You might, you know, like not use Hyena, but go use those instead. But, well, I think I prefer the Hyena clock for the hit chance. I guess I just take the 5%. Well, they are a tank, right? If they get hit, so be it. You know, it's their job. They probably can survive uh, until we go and help him. Um, by the way, let's talk about uh, a small thing with the Butterforge dodge here, which is how initiative works, right? So, then, as you fatigue out, let's say with your Nimble Bros, right? Your Nimble Bros might have about 60, 70 fatigue. As they fatigue out, they will lose that much initiative. So let's say those guys, right? Let's say this guy start out with 130 initiative. If they use up all the fatigue, 70. If they fatigue power max out, they will lose 70 initiative. So they have, what, 50 left? 60, 60 left. Well, they, they lose like half of their dodge. That is not great. But that's why they also take a perk called Relentless. That kind of half this penalty. So they will only lose 35. So now they will still have 95 initiative, right? And that will st still translate into something like maybe 15 dodge or something, I don't know. Math is hard, man. So yeah. So these guys with high stamina, they rely on Relentless to maintain their dodge high. What about those guys though? They will, be take they will not be taking Relentless, but because their fatigue pool is so low, they're gonna have about 20 to 25, 25 fatigue. Well, with relentless, they will lose only half of that as initiative penalty. But hey, like losing 10 or losing 20 it doesn't make that much difference, right? 10 initiative is like one and a half defense. It's not that much. So yeah, because they don't have that much fatigue to lose, they don't have that much initiative to lose anyway. So they can still maintain about 10 dodge, I mean 10 defense from dodge usually. So those guys just have 10 more defense compared to other, basically. It's Battleforge built with 10 more defense. But maybe a bit 
weaker to big hits, but hey, 10 defense is huge, right? For those guys, for those guys, right? Uh, for those, all, all those, I think, like, they can only have their natural stamina, I mean, their natural defense to protect them, along with their armor. Natural defense can only get you so far. Let's say a guy with 10 defense to start with, which is quite high. With 2 star, they're gonna get to all the way to 40. Those guys, same guy, they get plus 10. That's 50. 50 and 40, big difference. 35 and 45, big difference. All right. So, yeah, those guys, more defense, but you're more vulnerable to, to RNG, basically. Uh, is that all? Yeah, I think that's all for now. I'll talk about those guys uh, later. Okay. So I have talked briefly about all these people and what they are good and not good against. Now let me show you the build. Hi there. Bit from the next day here. So in the last part, right, I talked about all the different ways you can mismatch Battle Force Nivo and Dodge. But I didn't go into details for them because they are just templates for our builds. You can fit any weapons to any of those templates. And they will work just fine. You can go Battle Forge Archer. You can go, I, I don't know, uh, Nimble Forge Tank. It's all gonna work fine. But some will make more sense than others. Um, I'm going to show you the builds that I use the most here that make the most sense. Okay, first of all, we got the Nimble Forge Cleaver and the Nimble Forge Maze Duel List. They are quite similar. Uh, the same template, just different weaponry. Uh, we weigh medium fame armor, um, good ones. The medium fame armor are somewhat rare, right? You find a lot of heavy battle forge armor and some often some crappy nimble forge armor. The me the, the good fame medium forge armor are quite hard to find. So, yeah, if you don't have those fame medium armor yet, I suggest you go for full battle forge first, and then once you find the medium armor, you switch to nimble forge, right? You're just gonna have to um. Make do with low fatigue when you wear heavy armor at first. And once you get, make the switch, you're gonna have more fatigue to play with. By the way, the stat requirements are down here. The star doesn't exactly represent what the brother have to look like. It just represents what he kind of needs. So like the Maestro list will need a decent amount of attack and decent amount of defense. And he might need some fatigue too. Though fatigue, HP and resolve, they are quite flexible. Because you need a balanced amount of each. So even if you don't have a star, you can just take the high roll for, for each level. You take a high roll from, from the best stats. And at, at the end, you probably will end up with something quite decent anyway. All right. So for Maze Duelist, we go Maze Duelist. For Cleaver, we go Two-Hand Cleaver, Quick Hands, so that we can use the Whip. You can also go Cleaver Duelist too. Uh, but I think that Big Cleaver is better because... Well, it has higher base damage and higher armor damage compared to a one-hand cleaver. That means it can chop up people with no armor better because of the high base damage. And combined with the high armor damage, it can also chop up armor better. It can't go through armor as well as the cleaver duelist. But once they shred the armor a bit first, they can cut through it just fine. So generally, big weapons are better against no armor, low armor, and high armor. The duelist excels again medium armor because they can punch right through. All right, so the Nimble Forge and Maze and Cleaver, they are very similar to the full Battle Forge Cleaver and the full Battle Forge Maze Duelist. They are the same, just switch one perk from Steel Brow to Nimble. With Nimble Forge, you're gonna have more fatigue to play with, right? So this is just based on like, do you have the, the armor? Do you, you have the brother? Do you want, how much fatigue do you want? All right, so those four builds, they are quite interchangeable. Next, we have the Battle Forge Fatigue Neutral. This guy is a two-hander, just attack once per turn. I usually make this out of a Swordmaster, because Swordmaster has really low HP and Fatigue. You can't really go for a balanced amount of HP and Fatigue for a Swordmaster, because they're going to end up with both of those stats low anyway. So what we do is that we dump all those Fatigue, we dump them into HP and Resolve, and we go Fatigue Neutral, we just hit it once per turn, but we do enjoy the extremely high attack and defense of the Swordmaster, all right? So for the weapon, you can go big maze, big flail, big axe, big hammer, whatever you want. 
Uh, I like to go Great Axe and Fearsome early on. They work pretty well together. But um, you can have a lot of flexible perk here. Uh, Gifted is also flexible. If you want to go Flail, you can go Flail with Headhunter instead of Gifted. By the way, a lot of by the way, a lot of my high end build, like the Nimble Forge and the Full Battle Forge and some of the uh, Fencer duelists, they don't have Gifted. Mainly because these high end builds, they are made out of premium brothers. Those guys probably have enough stats already. So they don't really need Gifted, but Gifted might still be mathematically correct for them. But um, because they are like the high end bros, I just want them to enjoy an extra perk, right? A cooler perk than Gifted, you know? If you still want a little bit more stats for them, they are always still those veteran levels. This is on the last 200 build that I still use with Berserk and without Recover and with a decent amount of fatigue. They don't really work well together, you know? You can only Berserk once or twice per fight because you don't have Recover and your fatigue pool is kind of low because you're wearing heavy armor. Um, but I still do it because the hammer is just that good. It has extremely high armor damage. It has AoE and it has Dagger. It also has Knockback from the AoE, by the way. So it has so much in one that the team kind of needs it. It's here because of the necessity, not because it, you know, is that good. It's actually not a great killing weapon. It don't really kill people that hard. Usually it's the duelist and the cleaver guy that do the killing. This guy, they just shred the armor and they dice, I mean, they, they stack at them and this, they just leave them there. For this build, you need someone really good. You need high attack, high defense, because this guy occupied a very dangerous spot in the team, which is the left flank. He's going to be tanking multiple orcs, multiple chosen maybe. And his only defense is his high armor and his high defense and his ability to smack any enemy and stack at them. He also needs to have high stamina so that he can proc berserk a couple times, maybe AoE a couple times without recover. Not my favorite builds, but they are still here because of how good the two hand hammer is. Stagger is basically stunned for unstunnable enemies, right? Alright, next up we got the Battle Force Lightning Sword. Um, I go Battle Force here, but you can go Nimble Force too for this guy if you want. You can go Duelist instead of my instead of Shio, by the way. I use this guy mainly to cut up uh, Goblins and Ancient Undead. Maybe also against Zombie to Zap guys. He has high defense, very tanky, so you can just walk in there and just zap him. And next we got the Battle Force Warsight. Again, um, I think the Nimble Forge might work better here because the Warsight is quite a fatigue intensive weapon too. But higher armor allows you to just walk into the Goblin face and slice them up behind their Palisades. I, I make this guy out of people with very high attack, but unusable defense. Maybe 20, maybe even 15 defense. In the back line with high armor, they are still quite protected and they can really utilize the Mushroom for even more damage. Next up is the Battle Forge tank. Alright, this is the traditional Battle Forge tank here with high defense, high stamina to spam shield wall and in down for a couple of turns. You can still shield wall forever if the conditions are met, but you can't really in down forever. So when you're trying to in down against a bunch of Lindworms, or maybe against a bunch of Unholds, or maybe Orc Warriors, you might have a downturn to recover. So be really careful about that. Again, right, high defense. Max armor and indomitable. Basically, when they have indom, they're unkillable, but be careful when you have that downturn to recover. All right. Uh, next, we got the Butterfosh Dodge Tank. Okay, this is the fatigue neutral version of the Butterfosh Tank, but we go Dodge instead for extra defense. So, he will have high defense. Ideally, he will be able to shield wall forever. So, this guy has a lot more defense than the Butterfosh Tank, but the downside is that they can't indom. So, yeah, but they can taunt. Uh, I go taunt for them. Taunt costs only 15 fatigue. And because they have dodge, they don't really need to shield wall all the time. So their defense already high enough. Sometimes I find that my tank are quite useless in, in fights. If you can go and taunt things, it kind of makes them more, you know, useful. Battle Forge dodge two handers. Okay, those are the fatigue neutral. Battle Forge guys, but instead of pumping port into more HP and resolve, we just dump them into initiative and get some more defense out of them. Yeah, again, you can use any two-hand weapon. 
I actually quite like the hammer and the axe here because it's nice to have a fast guy with a big weapon, right? So they can shred the armor before the two hand cleaver or the mace twist can capitalize on that. Here is the fencer. Fencer is one of the strongest beyond the game, also one of my favorites. They are very stat hungry and they are very perk hungry. In fact, they are missing a couple perks here. So we don't have underdog at all. I go overwhelmed instead of underdog because I think that the fencer don't want to be in the middle of the fight anyway. What you want to do is you skirt around the edge of the battle and you just pick off uh, the enemies. And in those situations where you go 1v1, maybe 1v2, overwhelm is probably better than the dog. Inevitably, you will find yourself surrounded by a lot of enemies. And the fencer can probably jump out of that with the fence, but sometimes you can't. So at some point, I will give him underdog from the jugs from the, from the uh, library anyway. But before you get underdog, right, be very careful of snakes because they can pull you in there. They can stagger you and take away your dodge. And they have backstabber and they want to kill you because you don't have underdog. So be careful about snakes when you use the fencer. And also don't go too rainbow and jump into too many enemies. This guy though, 1v1, he is unkillable. He can cut down chosen, cut down anything. Unless they have extreme armor like orc warrior. Maybe try to avoid the orc warrior. Try to, you know, like scoot around and jump at those orc young and berserker instead. Uh, by the way, Fencer, they have so much initiative, they will always move first. When you move first, right, you can spend all duration points and just wait turn. If enemy stuns you or daze you or uh, throws sun at you while you are waiting your turn, when your turn ends, those effects will be gone, right? Or at least the effect duration will be cut. So you're kind of immune to stun and sun. Some effects that last longer, that, like daze or charm, they will last one turn shorter. So that's the upside of moving that fast. Here we got the Dagger Duelist. They are very similar to the Fencer. Built quite similarly too, but they have lower requirements. They need less attack, they need less defense, they need less dodge. Um, because they can overwhelm more. Um, with the Dagger, you, they can overwhelm more. They can have Underdog instead of Recover because they doesn't consume a lot of stamina at all. It's a very forgiving build to make because you don't require much at all, you know? Initiative can fudge up your defense, and you don't even need that much initiative to begin with. Uh, you just need enough to go before most enemies. Basically, 130 before all the armor and weapon is what I go for. First of all, right, a dagger duelist that hit three times per turn already deal more damage than, say, a sword duelist that hit two times per turn. So just casually stabbing the enemy three times is already higher damage than other duelists. Second, you can overwhelm them three times per turn. Nothing in this game re resists overwhelm, right? Third, um, you have extra mobility. You can walk three tiles and hit once. You can walk one tile and hit twice. Just that flexibility just help you out so much. Um, you don't even need that much attack because you hit three times, right? Even if you miss once, it is still okay. So this guy has so much going for it for him here, and I like him a lot. Early on, he can help puncture raiders. Later on, right, like he can overwhelm and stab people with high damage. If you get him to death blow three times, the damage should go through the roof. Next is the Nimble Maze Katal. This is quite similar to the Dagger Duelist, but instead of going Duelist, we go for Quick Hands so we can rock a big maze. One of the weaknesses of the Dagger Duelist is that they can't deal with the very high armor. With the big maze, well, you can take care of that problem. This guy is like the early game variant of the Dagger Duelist. Usually early on when I don't have a Fame Katal Dagger yet, the Duelist isn't that great. But hey, smacking people with a two hand maze is always good. So this guy, very low requirement, by the way. He can go in, smack, quick hand, death blow. He can just stab people three times with overwhelmed like normal. Or sometimes he can smack twice with the maybe with Berserk. So yeah, he's very flexible. And yeah, having access to days from the maze and overwhelm from the dagger early on is amazing. Not to mention the days death blow combo, right? And for the Nimble Dodge, finally we got the Nimble Dodge tank. This guy doesn't need to have that much defense or initiative at all. They just need some of each and combined together, they can have quite a bit of defense. And because they are nimble, they have quite a bit of stamina so they can spam Indom and Shore Wall when they need to. Also, I throw in the Dagger of one package so that in fights where they don't need to tank that hard, they can hop over Worm and puncture things. Basically, these are quite uh, early game version of the tank too. Good against Ifrit, good against Big Beast and you know, anything overwhelmable. Moving on, we got the Thrower Archer. This is my staple range guy. I like the bows for its high range and high DPS against low armor. And up close, we got the Javelin with the high piercing damage. 
you will need 90 plus range skill to make a decent bowman. This guy is here to shoot down annoying things from afar, like goblins, like hexen, like necromancer, and like other type of marksman archer and such. Also, low armor dangerous things like orc berserker from afar, just shoot them down, you know. If things go near you, you can jump at them. If things catch you, you can just fuku away, right? I have this gifted over here, but it's a flexible perk. You can take anything really. You can take back in belts, you can take um, Colossus. Pacification, execution is quite nice too. Bullseye, An anticipation, even overwhelm, fearsome. I have tried them all. They are all decent. All right. Um, the crossbow polar is basically the fail product of the throw archer. If you hire a hunter and he doesn't draw any rain skill, you can just make him into a crossbow polar guy. Crossbow Fulham is quite nice early on to shoot down Raiders and Nomads. I also threw in Fearsome because I think Fearsome is quite good against Nomad and Raiders too. So I just double down on that. Mm, the Polam allows you some flexibility too, you know. The turns when your frontline meets the enemy, you can shoot the crossbow and then slap someone with the Polam. But later on, the crossbow doesn't have as much DPS like the bow and the javelin. So this guy, I usually go for early mid game. Okay, next we got the Bannerman. Bannerman is simply here just to raise a banner and rally when you need to. You don't really need to do that that often. So I try to make them more useful in other cases. I go for Polar Mastery so that they can poke people with the Fearsome a little bit. And also I go for High Fatigue and High Defense so that they can uh, rotate people out when they're in trouble. I don't go for Rotate on a lot of my frontline builds. So having a rotation guy in the middle of the team that can reposition or and get people out of trouble whenever I need to is really nice. And the cross um, and and the crossbow gunner banner is here for people who like to make them more useful in range. Uh, you don't need to raise the banner all the time, so you might want to use a weapon that can contribute a bit more. Uh, I go crossbow or maybe even gun with fearsome. Just make sure you can yeah you can go whatever you want. Just make sure that you can rally when you need to, that's all. Okay, uh, next are the paper builds. These guys are like the early game builds. Uh, these are the random recruits that you find early on. You will try to make them as useful as possible, as early as possible. So for the stunner, I go Colossus, Gifted, Backstabber, and then into Maze Mastery. So at level 5, I have someone that can stun anything very reliably, as long as you got some surround on them. At level 6, I might go back for Recover, so that I make sure that I can stun them for as long as I need. Level 7, we go Nimble, level 8, I might go back for Passivation so that I can stun those pesky Annoying Shield Wall or maybe a Champion or maybe Dodgy Swordmaster in, in the arena. Uh, next, we got the Blade Thrower. Basically, this guy, his goal is to reach level 5 as soon as possible to have access to Throwing Mastery. The Javelin early on destroyed Raiders and Nomad. Uh, those Shield Wall Raider, those Two Hand Raider, those scary ones, you know, just chuck Javelin at them. But he also pump up some melee skill. To have a sword in the backpack so that he can defend himself when enemy get close to them. They are in the front line, right? So when things get close to them, they can pick to the sword. And that's they they are still a sword or, or maybe spear duelist. They can defend themselves for sure. But enemy can kill them very quick too. So these guys are just usually early game builds. One enemy is done with more archers. This guy can't really stay in the front line anymore because he has nothing to protect himself from arrows. So either you face them out or you put them in the back line. Um, I go for Executioner for even more damage against the Raiders. You can even go Fearsome. You might cut Gifted and go for Fearsome or maybe cut uh, something else and go for Fearsome. If you really want to target those Raider and Nomad early on, you know. Alright, the Plebby Two-Hander. Um, yeah, again, another build in the front line without either dodge or shield. Arrow will destroy him, but he's here before Arrow become a problem. Uh, basically, early on, right, sometimes you just need someone who can use a big weapon and hit some of those dangerous target ones. That's it. You just need to connect his big axe with his intended target. Right, he may only get to hit once or twice or three times per fight before his armor run out. But with Nimble, he probably won't die. Uh, this guy's here like around day 30, 40 maybe. When you kind of need that spike in damage for your team. You can't just go, you know, like, may shield, dagger, 
double grief flail, maybe sword shield forever. You, at some point, you need to transition. And if you don't have any Battleforge armor yet, if you don't have any good brother to become Battleforge 200 yet, you might be content with just a crappy nimble guy who use an axe, you know. Or maybe hammer for when you need to stake a big beast, or maybe dice when you need to dice those scary enemies, you know, like any 200 girls. All right, next we got the Plep Spear. Well, the Plep Spear guy is here to help you early on against those small beast fights, like Naxxarros, Dire Wolf, Spider. You need help against them. Also, help you a lot against zombie. Those big zombie fights with Necromancer behind them, sometimes they can put a lot of pressure on your team. Having a Spear War guy can take care of that entire fight. Um, also, later on, you might, if they survive later on, you might want to go for some duelist so that you can uh, go through shield wall and fear some of them. Sometimes this guy can help you against those sword master early on that you run into. Even with net, they still have so much defense. That extra hit chance over here with the spear can help you take them down. Finally, we got the plep nimble tank. Well, this guy is, yeah, for when early on you just need someone who can tank a bit of pressure. Uh, you go, yeah, you go for a little bit of defense. I like to go for rotation early so we can save people. This guy, you know, we probably won't want to keep him for long anyway. So for any of these players, I usually have rotation. So for any time that they need to go and save someone, they can, right? Early on, things are scary. Things might go wrong. If I have to sacrifice a player to save someone more valuable, I will. Okay, finally, moving on to the Nimble Forge Dodge Hybrid build. So this guy, right, um, I think they can work, but I just don't see the point really. This guy is basically a Battle Forge Dodge, but I swap Steel Brow for Nimble. Yeah, we wear medium armor, we rock a 200 weapon, we hit only once per turn. And well, it's okay, you know, it's gonna work. It has some upside, some downside with tankiness. You will have more stamina to play with compared to a uh, traditional fatigue neutral battle force guy. Uh, they weak, the fatigue neutral battle force weakness is that they don't have a big fatigue pool. So when they have to walk around in the, in the swamp, even with Pathfinder, it's still going to be a pain. When you have to fight against multiple goblin shaman that just keep rooting you down, uh, they are going to cry because with 20 stamina, they can't break the net and do anything else. In fact, anyone is going to cry when they face multiple shaman in a fight, but this guy will cry the hardest. Well, the Nimble Forge dodge two-hander, they might get a little bit more stamina to play with, I suppose. So maybe that's, uh, yeah, maybe that's the thing is good medium fame armor are hard to come by. And you can fight a lot of heavy Battle Forge armor. But the good Nimble Forge armor are hard to come by. They are quite premium. So usually I reserve them for the best damage dealer that I have. I'm not sure if I have the spare armor for these guys, but hey. They can work for sure. They have a bit more stamina compared to the other fatigue neutral build. They are less tanky overall. But maybe they are more injury resistant. Overall, they are okay, you know. You can try them out if you want. Maybe you find someone with really, really low stamina. That can't really go Battle Forge dodge or just Battle Forge Fatigue Neutral. Then you might want to lighten his armor a bit and go Nimble Forge so that he can have enough stamina to play around with. And also, I have this Nimble Forge Dodge Duelist version. Um, this is basically similar to the Dagger Duelist. So instead of Dagger over one, um, we just skip that over one. We throw it into Nimble and we pick whatever Duelist you want, really. Um, so I go for a sword here because a sword doesn't cost a lot of stamina uh, without recover, which, you know, like we are lacking. Mm, a weapon that doesn't cost too much stamina is preferable. So yeah, as you can see, this guy is still lacking a couple perks, right? We kind of want recover, we kind of want pathfinder. But hey, if you want a duelist, that is quite light and have dodge and also has some armor. Yeah. This guy, I can see him working. You can go Curve Sword Duelist, you can go Stress Sword Duelist. Lightning Sword Duelist, maybe. He won't have that much stamina, though. Kind of an incomplete build here. But hey, I'm sure it's gonna work. 
All right, so that's all the builds that I usually use. I think they make the most sense because between them, I get. I think they make. I think they make the most sense because between them, I am covered from the early game to the mid game to the to the late game. Um, they all they all serve a they all serve a purpose against different type of enemies. I think they fit my playstyle. Your playstyle might be different from mine. And if that's the case, you will have to make a couple of tweaks here and there. You will have to figure it out. All right. So that's it for the video here today. I hope you enjoy. I hope it helps. If you have any question, just ask me down below. If I miss any of your favorite builds, also put your suggestions in the comments. All right. Take care, boys. If you haven't, consider subscribing, by the way. Video out. See ya.